Carson Block, founder of Muddy Waters Capital and the host of Zeros TV and Zero F- Given podcast. It is so great to see you again and great to have you on the show. Welcome. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. And for folks who are watching or listening, uh, Carson, you are a well-known activist short seller. You made your name uh, shorting several Chinese frauds, probably well over a decade um, at this point. I know you have some new ideas, which we're going to discuss on the show, but I was hoping just to get folks up to speed, it might be helpful to start with a bit of your origin story, because I know you weren't always a short seller. I think you even did things on the long side. And also you were an attorney, which I didn't actually know until very recently. So let's kind of start with the origin story. Okay, I will try to nutshell this, but um, I grew up in the market. So my father was sell side uh, analyst as well as institutional salesperson. And he raised me and he raised me to believe that managements are good. And if the stock tanks all of a sudden, just pick up the phone and call the CFO or CEO, ask them what happened. And they, they would usually say, oh, everything's great. And uh, you go out and buy some more of the stock. But um, I graduated from university in 98 and um, basically I, I went into I went to China briefly, then went into banking for a large bank. Then I worked with my father. Um, and so we started working together in late 99 and we worked with each other through full time, at least for me, through 2002. And we were covering long side only uh, micro cap stocks. And these were U.S. centric companies, but we were getting lied to all the time. And um, just what one of the companies my father had followed for over four years and thought that he was pretty tight with the CFO. That CFO pled guilty to fraud and did some prison time back when that was actually a thing. Um, and, you know, for me, it just at the same time this was happening to us, you had Enron, WorldCom, Health South, Adelphi, et cetera. The largest companies in the world were blowing up also in frauds and scandals. So it looked to me like the market was riddled from top to bottom with liars who were just there trying to prey on investors and effectively take their money by dumping stock to them. So um, I was disillusioned and I felt that if I went to law school, I would be able to get some tools to put in my toolbox to make me, I had this amorphous sense that it would help me better protect myself against these guys was how I put it at the time. And I went to law school having no intention to practice law and um, Thing was, when I got to law school, I really enjoyed it. I, I had a great time in law school. I did pretty well. And then I figured, okay, I'll practice for a little bit. So practiced briefly for a U.S. law firm in China. And then I left to set up the first self-storage business in mainland China. And that was, that was a lesson in many ways. But a couple of years later and you know, many near-death experiences uh, from a business perspective, My father got interested in some of these Chinese companies that were listed in the U.S., these high growth, you know, too good to be true companies that were, in fact, too good to be true. He asked me to diligence one of them um, at the beginning, and I was reluctant because I was just barely keeping my thing from failing, my self-storage company. But fine, I took a look at this one company called Orient Paper, and... I was shocked. I had never seen something. Um, it turned out that the company was a near total fraud. It had a market cap of $150 million at the time. And when I went up to see it in January of 2010 and realized it was a fraud, I didn't really know what to do with it. Um, I asked my father if he wanted to short it. And he said, nope, I've never shorted anything in my life. As far as I'm concerned, my involvement ends here. And I thought about doing it as putting out a report as a side project, but I had no money at that point. I had basically incinerated my life savings in the self-storage business. And after a few weeks of trying to find some sort of financial backing, I just dropped it because I assumed, okay, they're going to file their, their 10K is due in March. They'll probably, uh, the auditor is probably going to figure this out. They won't get an um, an audit opinion and the stock will be halted and that's it. So I put it down until April of 2010 when um, I just had this random thought like, oh yeah, what's going on with this stock? 
So I pulled it up on Yahoo Finance and I was amazed it was still trading. So, you know, again, this was a very bad job of not shelling it, but I worked on putting a report together and I sent it out to the Ether June 28th of 2010, sent it to 50 people in the markets I'd last spoken to nine or 10 years earlier. The report went viral and one year later, Bloomberg uh, named me one of the 50 most influential in global finance with Ben Bernanke and Warren Buffett. So it was basically like winning the lottery. And um, as you said, I started off with these Chinese frauds, just exposed one after the other uh, for a period of a year and a half and then came up for air and realized that the dysfunction that enabled these com these empty boxes to list in the US and raise money was the same dysfunction basically that I'd encountered earlier in my career, the conflicts of interest, the laziness and aptitude, et cetera. Um, it was just, that was the most egregious corner of the capital markets. But the reality was, and it was clear to me at this point in 2012, that wherever there are capital markets, that's where the smart crooks are gonna go. And as long as there's stock borrow and liquidity, people are going to be doing things that are wrong and I could build a business on exposing that. So that's what I've been doing since 2010. Yeah. Um, for folks who are, who are watching and listening, um, that first short of yours was Orient Paper. Um, I And that was, I, I do remember that report because you're right, the virality of it. And if I remember correctly, it was like literally they mounds of trash that they're kind of like valuing at millions and millions of dollars. It was crazy. Um, you, yeah. know, you were also known too for um, your Sino Forest one, which some big name hedge funds just got their faces ripped off on that one, which if I remember that one correctly, you had to do like the, you, I remember the report, like the trucking, they weren't even, the capabilities to even truck as many logs as they were saying was impossible because it was like this narrow mountain road, if I remember correctly. You can correct me on right. that. Yeah, that's uh, it, that was in Yunnan province where that was the one real tree supplier they actually did have. So they they disclosed these five large suppliers of trees and four of them were fake. They were apartments in, you know, tier eight cities with like laundry on the balcony and nobody home and the neighbors having no idea what, you know, the, what that there was a business supposedly next door selling huge amounts of, uh, of timber, but the one real supplier was in Yunnan province. And we actually came across the documentation in the government filings that showed that the volume of timber that Sinoforce actually purchased was something like 1 15th or 1 16th as much as they claimed to have purchased. And then, yeah, when you do the math and understand how much is actually harvested from that part of China and the capacity of the roads, there was, there was no way. There were so many ways of looking at. We also made a comparison to the the GDP of the area and Sino Forest. Their claimed revenue from this far exceeded the GDP of the area. So it just there were there were just so many ways in which it was demonstrably a fraud. But um, you know we have to make all of those arguments because, like you said, there were some large investors in that and. The way this business works in investing, it turns out that if you get one or two big name investors in a stock, all of these other investors, whether they're uh, professional investors or retail, they cluster in and they all say, oh, well, you know, I'm sure so-and-so did their due diligence. And I got to tell you, nine out of 10 times, probably nobody did any due diligence. It just was a good story. So... Anyway, that was uh, that was Sino Forest. Yeah, um, we've seen that movie play out time and time again. Of like you said, so and so must have done the due diligence. Reality is, no one did any. Um, you mentioned, you know, like working with your dad earlier, kind of becoming disillusioned because of the the management that would like just outright lie, um, and then obviously going to law school, and then kind of coming into the space of like um, exposing these Chinese um, frauds and, and wrongdoings and. Um, you talk about like how in these areas, smart crooks are always going to kind of flock to these areas. Um, so there was a period of time and a lot of that was in these Chinese frauds, these stocks that were being listed, I think, in the U.S., sold to U.S. retail investors and whatnot. Where are you seeing the kind of dysfunction today? Are you seeing like areas where it's kind of starting to pool and it's uh, getting your interest? So one thing I do want to make clear is that 
today, Muddy Waters Capital, when we publish, probably 75, 80% of what we publish, these are things that are not at least likely to be adjudicated frauds, right? They're just on the right side of the line. And that's one of the just foundational dysfunctions of Western society today is that you can do things that are intellectually fraudulent, but are just on the right side of the line. It's this phenomenon that I call the tick the box apocalypse. So that, uh, so if, so for including this broader category, um, not just fraudulent from a legal perspective, but intellectually fraudulent, where their uh, management is intending to deceive the investors, um, then yeah, I'd say, look, it, it knows no bounds in terms of industries, but where there certainly is a lot of it is in the green tech space. All where these companies that can attract these ESG fund flows, there's just so much grifting in that space that I, I feel like it's the second mass investing delusion I've witnessed in the short side, short leg of my career. The first one being China. Let's explore that further because that that's quite the telling statement. If you're saying this is like the the second biggest you've seen aside from China, the grifting in the space, can you kind of elaborate a bit more on that and specifically like what are you seeing take place in that in that realm? So with the companies that are public, so one thing that we see is when there are tax subsidies available, we see these companies just effectively, and so the key here is effectively. Um, because unless I can prove it's a lie, you know, and have the smoking gun email, it's, I'm saying effectively lying. I think they're making statements that they can barely make with a straight face, but they're telling the U.S. government that the values of these assets that they're purchasing or deploying are way up here in order to get greater tax subsidies, and they're not. And with even with those huge tax subsidies, those inflated tax subsidies, these businesses are non-economic. But then they turn around and they tell investors, oh, yeah, don't, you know, don't worry about what we've securitized. You know, people are going to be using these assets forever and they're and they don't degrade quickly at all. And so, I mean, when I when I talk about that, I'm talking about a company that we shorted publicly over the summer, Sunrun. But Sunrun is emblematic of many of these companies. I think the solar industry in general is doing this. But um, we've seen it also when we shorted a fake vehicle electrification company in 2021 called XL Fleet. I uh, saw it with you know, a bioplastic company that's nowhere that's called Danimer. So exaggerations about the capabilities, the benefits, um, downplaying the costs and the difficulties to, uh, the, the difficulties to commercializing projects. And then when you get to, again, more the more established ESG green tech type companies, such as the solar companies, basically lying to investors and the government in order to get money to fund these businesses that are non-economic. Yeah. Um, let's explore the Sunrun example. Like as if, uh, talk to me as if I'm someone who, I, I know it's in solar, like, but as if I don't know much about it, if I'm just a, you know, everyday kind of retail investor, walk me through the thesis and some of the things that you're seeing? Sure. So with Sunrun, and this is typical of the residential solar companies, the vast majority of their customers or the vast majority of yeah, customers are not actually purchasing the, the PV systems. They're leasing them effectively. They enter into these power purchase agreements. But if you did purchase from Sunrun, you would pay approximately $3 per watt. And then you would go to the IRS and you'd say, okay, I paid $3 a watt. The IRS would say, okay, it's a 30% tax credit. So you get 90 cents tax credit um, for each watt, you know, 30% of $3. Now, what Sunrun does though, when 70% 70 70 of their deployments enter into these PPAs, Sunrun does all these backflips and you know, from one entity to another to another, and then turns around and says to the government, hey, this this asset actually the lease oh we value this at five dollars a watt so sunrun's going to come away with about a dollar fifty tax credit versus your 90 cent tax credit and really the way that they do this it's all based on these assumptions that we think are not good assumptions and are not good faith assumptions 
and we wrote extensively about each of the assumptions that they use to, to get to this roughly $5 watt number. Um, but then the best part is Sunrun can't even, and these other solar companies can't even come close to making profits. So they can't use the tax credits themselves. They turn around and sell them to big tech companies and large banks. So that's one leg of the stool for financing these is the inflated tax credit. So they're screwing Uncle Sam, they're screwing you and me in order to get this. Then they, then they say, okay, we have these PPAs, these power purchase agreements, and these are 20 to 25 years in length. So they then securitize them. So they basically borrow against those, uh, against those cash flows. So that's the other critical leg of the financing stool. But the final leg is the equity stool. So they say, well, yes, we've securitized a bunch of these cash flows, but you know what, investors? We assume that almost everybody at the end of their 20, 25 year lease is going to keep these systems. And they're not even gonna require us to replace them with new systems. They'll keep the same system. So we're assuming, in the case of Sunrun, zero panel removal liability. We're assuming 90% renewal. And based on that, and then we're gonna discount that back at only 5%. You know, P.S., the 10 year is like close to 4%, but they're telling you that with all these kind of crazy assumptions that I just outlined, that the cash flows they're projecting, they're discounting back at only 5%. And then they say, okay, so that's worth blah billion dollars. And that's what our market cap should be equal to. And so they're, they're bamboozling investors into thinking there's this, as I call it, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow here with these PPA agreements. So it's just, it's just entirely disingenuous. And the thing is, when you look at companies that are public in this space, you know, in the green tech space, and um, the ones that are getting the money are the ones that are basically trying the hardest to get money. Those are the ones that get big. Now, are they doing it because they've got the greatest, that they're basically deploying, or they're selling products or creating things that are gonna be of the greatest lasting value to humanity? The answer is no. They're just better at sucking up money than everybody else is. So I, at the end of the day, like, I don't think that these people are going to be saving the planet. They're, when you look at Sunrun, the insiders have dumped a few, a couple hundred million dollars worth of stock in the past year and a half. So it's, you know, they're not out here to save the planet. They're out here to enrich themselves. And look, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's what capitalism is about. But when they're doing it on the back of misrepresentations and you know what i what i would term lies then that's where we have the problem right cuz you're not you're not accusing them of fraud you're just pointing out um you see like an uneconomic business built on those three uh, shaky pillars as you put it um it's intellectually fraudulent but gotcha. if we're talking but fraud is a fraud is a legal term mm -hmm. so unless i have in this case an email where they're laughing about the $5 and $5 a watt valuations, then they're not going to be convicted of fraud. Maybe there's, maybe the IRS could make a tax fraud case. I don't know, but it's not like one of these things where I, I'm, we're looking at a company from China that says it did a hundred million dollars in revenue when it really did two and a half. I mean, that's easy to call a fraud. So from a, I, I, I feel like this is one of these things where in today's tick the box apocalypse, they're just on the right side legally. Like you can't get them. You can't prove that they know that these numbers and assumptions aren't good. But if you could, then it would be fraud. But at this point, it's intellectually fraudulent. And I guess th this gets to an interesting question because from or an interesting point, because from my chair, I know that investors will make they will care more if I can use the F word and call something a fraud. But at the end of the day, if the effect on the financials is the same, if the information is not accurate, if it does not reflect the economic reality of the business, it really shouldn't matter whether it crosses the line legally into fraud or not. It is what it is. And it's not, it's a deliberate attempt to mislead investors into providing capital um, at a much lower cost than they otherwise would if they actually were giving out genuine information. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I'm curious, like, do you, what, what would kind of make it even more uneconomic? Does like a rising rate environment impact like the businesses that you short as well? 
Well, it should, right? And again, when we look at when we look at these companies like Sunrun or the other solar companies that are basically saying to investors, these are our net earning assets. So net of what we've securitized off. This is the present value of these cash flows. And when the 10 year is at about 4%, and in the case of Sunova, their discount rate is 4%. Like, like this is the, you know, a rising rate environment should obliterate that number. Right. So, I mean, if we adjusted, if we used a realistic discount rate based on today's rate environment, I mean, those numbers would probably drop to zero or go effectively. So, yeah, the rising rate environment should be a problem for them. But that's why these companies, I feel like they're just trying to, it's like if an equity version of um, extend and pretend, right? Like, let's just keep this going as long as we can you know, keep the 4%, 5% discount rates as long as we can, sell as much stock while we can get away with it. And then at some point, if it blows up, oh, well, you know, we'll ride off into the sunset and, you know, jump on our private jet. And for folks who are listening and watching, you do publish all of your reports um, on your website, Muddy Waters Research, and uh, they can go and look at the work that you've done on Sunrun. Your newest one that you just came out with, I think just the other week, um, is a short on D-Local, a payments company. What is what is the thesis there, Carson? Sure. So D-Local is a, it's, it's a payments company based in Uruguay, focused on emerging markets, and it spun out of a high-risk payments business. So payment business that was focused on processing payments for online gambling, porn and other things where there are a lot of fraud uh, there's a lot of fraud and charge and chargebacks so d local went public in 2021 and on the offering itself the the ipo the managers and directors i mean this includes some former managers and directors but individuals dumped about 330 million dollars worth of stock d local only raised 87 million on that ipo then five months later they did a secondary and the, those same individuals dumped another 600 and change million dollars worth of stock. So within five months of being public, these guys have sold, individuals have sold about a billion dollars worth of stock. And that's, that doesn't include VC backers that have sold stock in the offerings as well. So that's not the thesis, but that is just indicative, I think, of the egregiousness of their conduct. And really, it's just bizarre to me that there'd be a bid at all for this stock get under those circumstances. But we think that D-Local is likely a fraud. So we've analyzed filings of its major subsidiaries. So there are three major subsidiaries. One is in Malta and two are in the UK. And we were unable, the, the, the cash flows don't reconcile. So that indicates to us that um, either the disclosures in the accounts with respect to the, uh, the cash flows are incomplete or inaccurate, or they might have dipped into client funds for to fund their cash needs, at least in the year 2020, which is the year, the most recent year for which subsidiary financials are available. We did catch them red handed in what, you know, should amount to actual fraud. And that has to do with a, a, pr a series of transactions. Well, basically a loan that was given to the CEO and president uh, by the company pre IPO. So that happened uh, in December of 2020, and the company said the, I, that the loan was never made and that they used outside capital to purchase these shares. But we actually see from these subsidiary filings that the loan was initially made. Then it seems like they decided that the optics of making such a big loan to um, officers right before the IPO was, was not good, and they tried to put the toothpaste back in the tube, and they changed their accounts to make it seem like that loan had never been made and that the shares had never been allotted. But again, they, the loan had been made, the shares were allotted. They just tried to like wipe that clean. And now this might not sound like the most damaging type of fraud one could commit, but what this shows is that they did cross a line. They were willing to cross the line. And this is proof that they did cross what I think is in this case, a legal line into that land, which they could be held uh, liable for fraud. So we, again, you pointed out that we have a, a, on our website, we have the reports. And so we've done a lot of research there on D-Local. It's very detailed. Um, we also go through a number of indicia 
that there is a problem um, with the accounts. It's one of the things that you that you focus on in our world of fraud shorting is when you see inconsistencies. So just to explain this a little bit better, um, there's an old saying that uh, one lie requires a thousand lies to cover up. And the reason for that is, you know, when you when you tell a lie here, especially when it comes to double entry bookkeeping, well, it creates a problem over here. So then you have to tell another lie there that creates problems over here and over here. And it's hard to remember all of the lies. And it's basically you have all these plates spinning. So when we see in when we see things like we did with D Local, where in the same filing, they have different amounts for their foreign currency receivables and their, what they call their net monetary position. You know, it's off by a few million in each case. And then the next filing, they pick one of those numbers, and then the following filing, they revert to the other number. I mean, that tells us that there's that that's a pretty good indication that there's a problem internally with the books. And they've also had similar disclosure um, inconsistencies with respect to their processing volume, what they call their TPV or total processing volume on behalf of their clients. So just things that cannot both be true, but that are said at different times. So that was that's really the stuff that piqued our interest. But then once we started scratching the surface and getting into the filings, then yeah, we, we feel like this company is likely a fraud and their accounts are yeah, not to be relied upon. I see. Um, they, they put a brief response on their website. I'll just quickly read it for folks. They said the report contains numerous inaccurate statements, groundless claims, and speculation. Short seller reports are often designed to drive the stock price downwards to serve a, the short seller's interest to the detriment of company shareholders. We caution shareholders from making investment decisions based on this report. D Local will rebut the allegations in the appropriate form in due course. I mean, um, were you, let me, let's talk about that. Were you expecting more of a, more of a statement from them or more of a rebuttal or is this kind of like par for the course? Well, yeah, I, I know it's kind of funny whenever companies come out and they say, oh, this is wrong, you know, these allegations are wrong, et cetera, but they don't discuss what's wrong and why it's wrong. So that, that was not unusual, okay? The stock fell quickly and so it's pretty normal for a company to put out what I call a placeholder response. You know, this is all wrong and we'll come back to you and answer these, you know, answer these allegations shortly. But um, as of the filming today, I mean, it's been, let's see here. So it, that was last Wednesday that we released the report. Today so is the 16th, a Monday. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Today yeah. is a Monday and there's still nothing. Now, what I am aware that the company is talking to institutional investors and trying to give them some, you know, trying to spin things and give them some version of events, which, you know, there was my first leg of my career, there was a new regulation promulgated by the SEC called Reg FD, which was supposed to ensure that when companies disseminate material information, they don't pick and choose to whom to disseminate, that they disseminate to all investors at the same time, you know, level playing field type of thing. Now, this is clearly violation of Reg FD, but to be fair to the company in this case, I don't think the SEC has ever enforced Reg FD. So, um, but yeah, they they're 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 trying to they're not putting anything down in writing yet, which um, look, I assume they will, but maybe the reason that they're not doing it is they know that I mean again, it's that problem with lying, and this this is the case with companies that are frauds that we've gone into these, these little wars with where they'll come back and they'll issue a statement that's filled with lies. And then we seize upon them and show that they're lying and then they end up looking stupid and you know the air comes out of these things. Um, you know, Sometimes it takes a little while for the air to come out. Other times it happens more or less all at once. But um, yeah, if you're along this company and you see this and they haven't issued a written response yet, yeah, I think your assumption should be that they're reluctant to put things in writing. And there's a pretty goddamn good reason why they are. Yeah. Um, and w when you put together these reports, it, you're going on, like you're looking at the document, the stuff that they're putting out there, the filings they're putting out there and like piecing it together. So I guess I kind of, it's almost like you're like a financial detective, forensic accountant, like you're able to kind of piece these things together. Could, 
I'm, I don't know how much you want to share, but could you kind of share with us like a bit of your process and approach to, you know, just how you kind of find these opportunities? Sure. So it's not rocket science. I mean, well, the question of how do we get the ideas is, is different from how do we, what's the process in executing them. In the case of DLocal, um, yes, yeah, somebody brought us the idea. They said, hey, you should take a look at this. And they were, they were fixated on this, um, this one transaction that happened right before the IPO where there was a, um, there was an, a- an asset acquisition. And so they said, oh, this looks funny. It was a $38.7 million prepayment for the asset, right? Like it's the, com- the company from which they acquired the assets, which were all intangible assets, it's based in Brazil. And the idea that somebody would make such a large payment in advance of the acquisition being effective was suspicious. And, um, you know, I, we agreed, but that was, that was kind of the starting point there. So, um, the process is, it's a lot, it's a lot of reading. So we went through every single filing, including the draft, uh, prospectuses. And that's where we start seeing these inconsistencies. So you have to read closely and you have to commit things to memory. It's wait a second. I think, I think they used a different number over here. And, so that's when we started seeing the that's when we started seeing these inconsistencies. But we speak with former um, employees, so generally employees who've been out for at least six months, and we use these things called expert networks to get in touch with them. And a lot of times we're just trying to understand, you know, how does this company work, and you know, what give us what did you do in your job, and to whom did you report, and what you know and what what's your view of you know things like controls how is money handled so we a lot of conversations with formers and then we also pull filings for all the subsidiaries that we can and this might be surprising to american investors but the vast majority of countries in the world companies privately held companies are or companies that are not themselves publicly traded they are required to file financial statements with um, companies house or some other companies registry and those financials are publicly available so you, we just start obtaining the financials for them and un- trying to understand okay how do these things piece together and how does money flow and um and that's really and yeah i mean when you know, just an example of it with the malta filings for the main malta operating entity so as i said there are three primary operating entities one in malta and two in the uk this one, we actually saw the doc. We actually saw the bank receipts showing the wires from the com- from one company account to another company account to make those loans. So we actually have like the Citibank wire receipts there. So you never know what's going to turn up. In a way, it's kind of like digging for treasure when you start looking through these filings. And then, yeah, we have accounting expertise in house. And so we we started looking at the cash flow statement and you know really trying to understand how the how the cash how the cash moved and then rec- doing a reconciliation and it didn't reconcile. So it's it's not rocket science. It's just a lot of digging. It takes a lot of time. And going back to your point earlier about well-regarded smart investors often being long these things. To be fair to them, in a case, in the case of a company like D Local, they're not going to have the, their business models don't enable them to do this kind of digging. Now, if they read all of the draft filings and saw the changing versions of accounts and things like that, then you'd think you'd like to think that they would be swift enough to catch on and think there could be an issue here. But they're not they, their business models don't allow them to do to read all of those filings it's just not how it's just not how the world works and so you get back to when i what i was saying earlier about these these problems in the system that enable frauds well everybody thinks the auditor is looking for fraud no the auditor is not looking for fraud in fact it's management that prepares the accounts and the auditor is just looking for reasonable assurance. And time and auditors do not look to detect um, forged documents. I mean, if the management if management provides them with forged documents and lies to them, almost always the auditors are going to be exculpated from liability based on the misrepresentations made to them. And so the auditors point at management. Management will. 
then point over at the lawyers. The lawyers will pay, point at the investment bankers, and like nobody takes responsibility. There are all these gaps in the system, and that's how these things happen. So we just look to basically do the work to find the things that have could have fallen through these gaps and to see what's really there. Yeah, I've heard you. Um, well. For folks listening, you're you're known as an activist short seller, but I've heard you use the term um, investor journalist, which I found interesting. Why the um, journalist moniker? Well, in some in some respects, it doesn't really matter. But when it comes to us in court, we're in a litigious business, and we get sued. I don't know, you know, every so often. And the thing is, what we've noticed that um, courts are inherently more skeptical of us when we get sued than they would be of, say, Bloomberg when when Bloomberg gets sued. And when I when I've I've had a lot of time over the past several years to spend reflecting on this because of the various litigations. And look, we get everything dismissed ultimately, but it's a question of how quickly do we get it dismissed. How much money do we spend on legal bullshit before we get it dismissed? And the fact that we're we're usually starting from a different point in the eyes of the court than a traditional journalist is um, has really led me to to down this this path of thinking that there isn't I don't think you know, like I think what we do is investigative journalism. It's investigative financial journalism. Now, people would push back and say, well, you know, but you're short the stocks. But that's kind of naive because every journalist wants, you know, there, there's some metric by which they measure themselves, but they all want attention. They want eyeballs, right? Like that's success. And there are financial journalists, when they investigative journalists, when they write about companies, like they do care what the stock price reaction is. You could read, um, book by an FT journalist, Dan McCrum. He just wrote a book about Wirecard. It's a fantastic book, but that's one of the things Dan was looking at. And he would get really depressed when he'd write these articles that show Wirecard's a fraud, at least in his eyes, and the stock doesn't react accordingly. So at the end of the day, I feel like it's a, I feel like it's false distinction to focus on, oh, well, as a short seller, you're short the stock, so you're not a journalist. I mean, we're all unearthing facts that are and and presenting them, and this and this is in the public interest. I mean, when it comes down to it, courts, generally then have found that what we do is core First Amendment protected speech. It's just that it takes them longer to get there because the word short seller is attached to it. So um, maybe it maybe journalist investor isn't the most pithy sounding label to use, but I do think that as an industry, we should start really trying to expand people's understandings and so that they do equate what what we do to what journalists do. Yeah. I also think like as someone who's, I guess I'm more of a former journalist, I think folks could also just learn a lot um, from you of like how to even like go about looking at um, unearthing some of these issues. Um, you mentioned like some of the litigation dealing with like accusations of defamation and whatnot, there seems to be, I don't know how to describe it, but a lot of times there's like a negative connotation with short selling or people think short selling is somehow inherently bad, whereas I would say it's an important part of the ecosystem, but that's just my opinion. Can you kind of like take me inside like the psychology of what it's like to be a short seller, some of the stuff you have to deal with that everyday people might not be fully aware of? Um, sure. So I guess like where, where to start is, is kind of the problem. Um, I guess, let me, let me uh, explain first why short selling exists and what we do as, you know, activist short sellers or investor journalists or whatever you want to call it is really a niche of that. But short selling, why, why does short selling exist? Well, it's really about property rights. Okay. So, when you look at when you look at something a car what is the highest and best use of a car it is to be driven okay you own a car you are permitted to drive it you are permitted to lend it to somebody you know maybe even rent it out you know, drive it for uber what have you a house 
highest and best use of a house is to be lived in. You own it, you're permitted to stay in it yourself, you're permitted to rent it out. Okay, a share of stock. The highest and best use of a share of stock is to be sold. That's what the purpose is. That's how it comes to life. The company sells it to you as the investor. And for you, you, you know, the point of it for you is to ultimately sell it for more money than you paid for. Now, it turns out that shares of stock are able to be loaned out the same way that cars and houses are able to be loaned out. So you as the long holder, you think that the stock's going to go up in price. Well, then you can take advantage of some really stupid people on the other side who are short sellers who think it's going to go down and are willing to pay you interest to borrow that stock. So during that massive bull market from 2009 through late 2021, I mean, the joke was entirely on short sellers, right? Because long holders were lending out their stock, the stocks were going up, and they were collecting interest from people who were stupid enough to be short the things and pay them and paying them for the the you know the I guess the anti privilege of being short. So that's why short selling exists. It's a property right that benefits longs. Now, how does it benefit the markets in general if you allow short selling? Generally, when you look at equity hedge funds, I mean they're generally they're long short funds. So they'll often say, okay, we've got our long book here. So we have a hundred million dollars in capital. So maybe, so we want to be long a hundred million dollars in stock. Well, that's kind of risky because if the market crashes on us, then I don't know, like that, we, that, that's going to be too big a deal. So you know what? Let's be long a hundred and short 50. And then maybe they'll say, you know what? We could maybe be short, say 70 and long 110. So by having, by allowing for short selling, it allows for more long buying. And when you say, okay, no more short selling, what ends up happening is there's deleveraging. And so longs, hedge funds that had short books and that close and that shrink their short books. And you saw this happen right after GameStop, where a lot of hedge funds said, whoa, I don't want to be short single name stocks. They shrunk their short books. So the shorts went up, but a lot of longs went down because they had to deleverage and decrease the size of their long books. So having the ability to protect and hedge on the downside is what enables long portfolios to be as big as they are. And if you said no more short selling, then you would have a sell off because you would have le- you would you would have less basically dry powder available on the long side. So that's why that's why it exists. Now, in terms of what we have to deal with, um yeah, I mean there's a lot of <laughs> you know when you're when you connect the world the way you do on social media, um, you get to see just how many truly insane people are out there. And a lot of them happen to coalesce around things that were short, um, not just we as Muddy Waters, but in short sellers in general. And a lot of times these are people who you know are not in great place in life and they blame other people for it. So they also buy these lottery tickets in the hopes that suddenly their lives are going to improve. And as an activist short seller, when we come along and say, no, actually, this thing's a scam, you know, delocal, it's probably a fraud. A lot of times they act like we're snatching these lottery tickets out of their hands and tearing them up in their faces and just throwing them, throwing them on the ground and laughing. That's how they perceive it, I think, in many cases. And they lash out with that kind of vitriol. I get direct messages all the time, everything from death threats to um, highly deviantly sexually suggestive messages about what I should be doing to myself or what they're going to do to me or somebody's going to do to me in prison. So um, I think you get the point. But the reality is, that the vast majority of people with whom we try to communicate when we go public on a short, they want us to be wrong. You know, they, they, and they're rooting for us to be wrong. And when you think about the bar to convince these people that there's something actually wrong with this, like where that bar is, given that they generally don't like what we're saying and they want us to be wrong. I mean, it's a high bar. And if we can clear that and convince people that despite their personal feelings toward us, and what we're saying, 
that they need to reevaluate a stock, well, then we're doing we're doing something right if we can if we can clear that bar. It's a much higher bar to clear than you know if you're telling people what to buy. I mean, that's that's kind of easy. People are happy to rush in and buy stupid shit all the time. Well, Carson, I want to pass it back to you to plug where folks can find you, your research, learn more, or any parting thoughts that you have for the folks watching and listening. Sure. So I'll <laughs> for the plug part. Yes, our reports are on www.muddywatersresearch.com. My Twitter handle is at muddywatersre, R-E. Uh, but yeah, we have Zeros TV. That's Z-E-R-0-E-S dot TV. And that's where we do our podcast. We're doing it every two weeks. It's um, unfiltered. It's on finance. We try to be funny. I mean, we make ourselves laugh and that's, you know, there's usually at least partial inebriation involved in that. But yeah, uh, look, we, you know, I think uh, if you're if you're interested in learning more about the underbelly of finance or just kind of understanding what we think is humorous and, and dark about it, then check those two um, sites out. Well, Carson Block, founder of Muddy Waters Capital, I thank you so much for your time and your ideas. Really appreciate you coming on the show and great to see you again. Thank you. Great to see you as well. Hey, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed that video. Be sure to hit that like button, the subscribe, and that bell so you won't miss any new videos.